Hello everyone. The topic of today's lecture is going to be multivariate regression models. Now, multivariate regression models are an extension of what we have covered last time when we talked about bivariate regression models. In the bivariate case, we had one independent variable and one dependent variable. In the case of multivariate regression, we are going to have one dependent variable but multiple independent variables. Topics that will be covered in today's lecture are going to be multicollinearity, dummy variables, natural logarithms, functional forms, and interaction terms. All those are concepts that are related to multivariate regression. As you remember, last time we talked about bivariate regression, where we had one dependent variable, which we called y, and we had one independent variable x. In the case of the multivariate regression model, we still have only one dependent variable, but we now have multiple independent variables. Now, when we consider the univariate or the multivariate regression model, the objective is always the same, in the sense that even in the multivariate regression model, we are going to have an error term, and our goal is to minimize the sum of the squared error terms. Now, as you remember, last time, what we did, we had the independent variable on the horizontal axis, that was x. We had the dependent variable on the vertical axis, y. And we said that there is an error term that describes the distance between an individual observation and the regression equation, which we wrote as y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 times x, where beta 0 was the intercept and beta 1 was the slope coefficient. Now, assume that we are going to extend our model and we are saying that the home values this is an example we have looked up uh, last time, that home values, which we call y here, are a function not only of square footage, but also the number of bedrooms, okay? Now, in this case, we can still represent the function graphically, but we would now be in the three-dimensional space where we have the bedrooms on one axis, we have the square footage on the second axis, and we have the price of the home on the third axis. Okay, so that would be a three-dimensional space. Okay. Now, to illustrate how this would look like, let us consider two examples. Okay. So, with two predictors, we are looking at not predicting a line, but we are actually describing a surface and we are looking at the distance between the actual, actual observations and the surface itself. To illustrate this concept of two independent variables and one dependent variable in the three-dimensional space, we can actually illustrate this in MATLAB. So I will be posting the code uh, for this on the Canvas web page, but all you have to do is you have to load the code and execute the following. Now, what you see is this three-dimensional picture, or what you're getting is this three-dimensional picture. Now, note that you have uh, what is called an interaction term here, and we will explain in more detail what this is later on, but this actually makes the regression plane slightly curved. Anyway, so if you see this graph, then you have the horsepower on the one axis, on the one x axis. You have the weight on the other x axis. Think about this as data about the cars, where we want to explain the miles per gallon or the fuel efficiency of the car based on the weight and also based on the horsepower of the car. Now, 
you see that you have the various observations. So for example, here you have a car that weighs 3,015 pounds and has um, 85 uh, horsepower and gets 38 miles to the gallon. Okay. Now you have those various observations. And again, what we are trying to do is to minimize the error term associated with the distance between a particular observation and the plane. Okay. Now in the bivariate regression model, we have seen that we are in the two dimensional space where we are trying to minimize the distance between an observation to a line. In this case, we are minimizing the distance between the observation and the, uh, and the plane, the mesh grid that is represented here. Note that you can also click on this Rotate 3D feature here in MATLAB. And then if you want to have a closer look at how this actually is uh, represented, you can rotate the graph uh, on your on your computer screen. Okay. And note that also the mesh here is of different colors. So the blue is means it's uh, very low in terms of miles per gallon, so very fuel inefficient. And the red here or the yellow represents the uh, higher fuel efficiency. But if you're thinking about multivariate regression, this is basically what we are doing. And of course, once we are going beyond the two dimensional, uh, once we're going beyond two independent variables, we are talking about a multi dimensional space. Now, the same assumptions that we have looked at in the bivariate regression model with a zero expected mean of the error terms, also the error terms being normally distributed as well as homoscedasticity and a linear model are still going to be valid for the multivariate regression model. Okay. Now, what will become an issue here, and in many cases it, in real, real world data, it is not that much of a problem if the model is correctly specified, is what is called multicollinearity. So for example, imagine you have a model where you include wealth and income as independent variables. In that case, you may face the issue of multicollinearity because wealth and income are highly correlated with each other. And we will see in this lecture of why this may cause a problem. Remember that the purpose of the multivariate regression model, or of any regression model for that matter, is to establish causality between the independent variables and the dependent variables. Now, it is very crucial to control for everything else that could influence your dependent variable. Now, let us do an example why that is important. Suppose that you would like to know what explains the food bill of a household or of a particular person in a given month, and you believe that this is a function of education. Now, you can run a model that estimates the food bill as a function of the years of education a person has, and there's a very likely chance that you are finding a significant relationship between, or a statistically significant relationship between education and food bill. Now, why may this be a problem? Is it really education that drives of how much a person spends on food, or is it income? So if you were to include income and education in your model to explain the food expenditure of a person, what you would likely find is that the, it is actually the income of a person that drives the food bill, and it is not education that drives the food bill. Of course, education and income may be highly correlated, which is the reason why you would find a statistically significant relationship if you only inc included education. Now, for a social science model, it is generally good practice that you consider your dependent variable in this case, or suppose it is uh, home values, and you think about all the variables that can actually influence your home value. Now, in the case of a house, you will probably say that it is the square footage of the house. It is going to be the lot size that will influence the home value, bedrooms, bathrooms, characteristics such as hardwood floors, or the number of garage spots, and of course, the location. Now, if you set up a model like this, 
and you execute the model and you find that, for example, the number of garage spots does not influence your dependent variable, then you should not exclude this variable from your model, but you should rather leave it in your model and say that garage spots are not a function, are, garage spots do not influence the home value. Okay? It is bad practice to think about a model, run the regression, and then simply look at which variables are statistically significant and just rerun the model with just those variables. Remember, the finding that, for example, garage spots are not statistically significant is a finding as well. Now, let us consider an example, our first example, with a multivariate regression model. What you will see is that everything you have learned for the bivariate regression model in terms of uh, how to implement it into, in R and RStudio applies directly to the multivariate, multivariate regression model. The same is also true for the interpretation of the, uh, for, of the coefficients. Now, for this particular example, we are going to look at a data set from North Carolina, and we want to explain how the crime rate is explained by unemployment, population density, and high school dropout rate. Now, let us consider the North Carolina crime data. First of all, note that the variable names in the data set, like public school enrollment, violent crime rate, and unemployment, are fairly long names. So what we can do to shorten up the expression that we have to type into, into MATLAB is to define the equation meaning we are looking at the violent crime rate as a function of population density, unemployment, and public school enrollment. And we are defining this outside the command uh, fitlm. Okay. Then on the next line, what you have to do is you can type fit lm, then you can define the data, which is crime in this case, and then instead of writing the equation, you can just say eqn, and then you can execute this, and you get the results for the model. So first of all, when you're looking at the results of a model, then you look at the estimate and see whether it is the right sign or whether it has the right sign. So before we said that we would hypothesize that population density, meaning being in a more urban area, would actually increase the crime rate. And we see that there is a positive relationship between population density and the crime rate. We would also assume or hypothesize that the more people, the more students are enrolled in school, or the higher the public school enrollment, that this again would actually uh, lower the crime rate. However, what we will see, what we, what we see here, is that the estimate is actually positive, meaning that the more public school enrollment, the higher the crime rate. But note, and we'll come to this. Uh, the variable is not statistically significant. And then the third variable of interest is the unemployment rate. Again, here we would hypothesize that the higher the unemployment, the higher the crime rate, meaning there is a positive relationship between the two variables. And we see indeed that the unemployment rate has, or the coefficient associated with the unemployment rate uh, is positive and hence there is a positive relationship between the unemployment rate and the violent crime rate. Now, in the previous lecture, we talked about the statistical significance of variables. Again, to determine the statistical significance of variables, you have to look into the column p-value. Everything below 10% or everything below 0.1 is statistically significant. So here you see that population density and unemployment 
is actually below 0.01 or below 1%. So here we would attribute this with three stars. Okay, if you're thinking about writing a report or in an academic paper. Now, the public school enrollment is not statistically significant because it is above the 10% threshold. But note that it is very close to that, uh, to that threshold. So if you ever were to write a report, you could mention that, yes, it is not statistically significant, but the threshold of 10% is very close. Okay. Now let us do a second example. And in this example, we are going to consider child mortality data from various countries. Child mortality is measured as the number of deaths per, per thousand birth, and we believe that, or we hypothesize that this is related to the gross national product of a country, basically measuring the income and the wealth of a country, and also the female literacy rate. We may have hypothesized that wealthier countries have lower child mortality rates, and that country, countries with a higher female literacy rates also have lower child mortality rates. Now we have data that measures the child mortality rate and the variables of interest between 1985 and 1980, no, between 1980 and 1985. And note that the data also contains the total fertility rate. The data set child mortality contains data about various child mortality rates of different countries. Note that you have CM as the child mortality, which is measured uh, per, as the number of deaths per thousand birth. And you also have the female literacy rate. You have the uh, per capita income or uh, per capita gross national product. And you also have uh, what is called the total fertility rate, which is the average number of children born uh, to a woman in a particular in a particular country. Okay, so the model that we are interested in in solving is written as follows. So we say again, fit LM, and the data is uh, child mortality. And the equation that we are interested in is uh, child mortality as a function of per capita gross national product and the female literacy rate. So when you execute this, then we have the results here. And now the question is, how do you interpret those results? First of all, you note that all the variables are statistically significant. And they are statistically significant at uh, less than 1% level. They also have the expected signs in the sense that the higher the female literacy rate and the higher the national income, the lower the child mortality rate. This is, is it, this is indicated by the, by the negative value in front of the coefficient estimates. Okay. Now, the coefficient associated with the income is very difficult or it's a little bit tricky to interpret since, first of all, it is very small and second, the child mortality is measured in uh, per thousand birth. So in order to better interpret the, uh, the coefficient associated with the income, what you can do is to say, well, what happens if income increases by $1,000? So if income increases by $1,000, then we can multiply the coefficient of negative 0.0056466 by $1,000 and we get negative 5.64. So what this means is that if the income in a particular country increases by $1,000, then 
the child mortality goes down by 5.6, um, child mortality death decreases by 5.6 children per thousand birth. Okay? Now, note that, and this is one advantage of a linear regression model, is that you do not need to know where the country currently stands in terms of income. Here, the thousand dollars is independent of where you, where you at, at which level the country currently is in terms of income. We, we will see that this is something we relax later, and you have additional explanation of how to interpret the coefficients in your slides as well. Now, let us look at one more data set to explain the basic concepts of multivariate regression and assume that we have data about uh, the number of accidents as a function of temperature and precipitation. Note that those number, numbers are made up and are simply a generic data set to illustrate the concept. So with the data accidents, you have the number of accidents on a particular day, you have the precipitation, and you also have the temperature uh, when those data uh, when this data was uh, collected. So the equation that we are interested in is uh, fit LM, and then the data is accidents, comma, and then the equation is accidents tilde temperature plus precipitation. When you run this, you get the coefficient estimates, and what you see is that precipitation is above 10%, or the p-value associated with precipitation is above 10%, and hence, we cannot reject the null hypothesis that the coefficient is actually equal to zero. So precipitation is not statistically significant. However, temperature is statistically significant at the 1% level. And in addition, the sign associated with the variable temperature also has the correct, uh, has the correct direction, in the sense that it is negative meaning that the higher the temperature, that this reduces uh, car accidents. Now, multicollinearity occurs if you have independent variables, and some of those independent variables are highly correlated with each other. Now, assume that you measure the home value based on the number of bedrooms, bathrooms, and the square footage. Now, assume that Every bedroom has one bathroom. Now, to illustrate this, let me write down the equation of how this would look like. So we have the price of the home, and this is a function of the square footage plus beta 2 times bedrooms plus beta 3 times bath. And now assume that each bedroom has a bathroom. So what this means is that bed equals bath. Okay. So then we could rewrite this equation as beta 0 plus beta 1 times the square footage plus beta 2 times bed plus beta 3 now, since bath equals bed, we can write bed. So if we rewrote this equation, what we would have is beta 0 plus beta 1 times the square footage plus beta 2 plus beta 3 times bed. So here you see that the regression model in this particular case is unable to differentiate between beta 2 and beta 3. Now this is a case of perfect multicollinearity. This can actually cause problems in a regression model, even in the case of unperfect multicollinearity. 
in the sense that two variables are simply highly correlated. To illustrate the problems that can arise from multicollinearity, we are going to use the dataset teaching. Note that the dataset is made up and manipulated, so do not use it for any type of uh, statement or research. Again, what you have, you have the SAT score in a particular county, you have the income in the county or the average income in the county, and you have two measures expenditure and faculty, which basically states of how intensive are students supported by, uh, by the county. So think about the expenditure as a dollar amount of how much is actually uh, spent on students. And think about the faculty, the faculty to student ratio. So what we're going to do, we are going to run three regression models. And the, independent, uh, the dependent variable is always the SAT score in the sense that we would like to explain what contributes to a high SAT score. And the independent variable is always going to be income. But in addition to income, we are also going to change the, we are going to add expenditure and faculty. So in the first regression equation, we write fit LM and the data set is teaching. And the equation that we are interested in estimating is the SAT tilde income, and then we are going to add expenditure. Okay. So this is the first equation that we are going to estimate. So when we, uh, when we run this, we see that all variables are statistically significant. Then the higher the income, the higher the SAT score. And also the more a school district or a county spends on their children, the higher the uh, SAT score, the higher the achievement. And again, all those variables are highly statistically significant. Now, let us run a second model where instead of looking at expenditure, we are going to actually include faculty. So the faculty, think about the faculty to student ratio. So we say faculty, then when we run this, we again see that the variables are all statistically significant given the p-value. And it also, as before, income is positively, uh, has a positive inf influence on the SAT score. And so does faculty, okay? Basically, think about the more faculty per student you have, the higher the SAT score, the higher the achievement. So what we have seen so far is that if you measure a model with income and expenditure, both are statistically significant. If you measure a model with, or if you estimate a model with income and faculty, again, income and faculty are statistically significant. Now, theoretically, what you would expect is that if you run a model with faculty and expenditure, that you should have a model with three statistically significant variables. However, what you see is that income is still statistically significant, but the statistical significance of expenditure is significantly reduced and faculty is not statistically significant anymore. Now here, what you have is a problem of multicollinearity because expenditure and faculty are highly correlated. Do not use plot, but use uh, scatter. So now here, what you have is, and again, note this is uh, made up data, but you see that the higher uh, the expenditure, the higher the faculty that they are moving in the same direction. Okay, so you can explain the level of faculty by the level of expenditure. And again, I know that this shape here is uh, looks weird, but this is made up data to illustrate the concept. So 
The bottom line is if you have two variables that are highly correlated with each other and you include them both in your model, like here faculty and expenditure, or if you imagine a house with one bedroom for every bathroom or, or vice versa, then your results may be misleading. Now, an extremely important aspect of multivariate regression or any regression model is the possibility to include what are called dummy variables into the model. Dummy variables allow you to include a qualitative characteristic coded as 0, 1 into your regression model. You can think about this as, for example, religion, gender, nationality, and so on. If you think back about the model that we analyzed for the home value, we have here, we have hardwood floors. Okay, so this would indicate whether the home has hardwood floors. Hardwood floors here in this case is a qualitative characteristic of the house. Either the house has hardwood floors or the house does not have hardwood floors. So in this case, the presence of hardwood floor, floors can be coded as a 0, 1 variable. Okay. So this is 1 with if the answer is yes, so there are hardwood floors, and it is 0 if there are no hardwood floors. Now the inclusion of dummy variables Note that dummy variables are only on the independent side of the equation, is that we can simply include them into our model, into our regression model. Okay. Now, suppose that we have data about a vehicle and that we have uh, used car data where we have the price of a used car, we have the miles of the used car, and we also have information about the drive of the car in the sense that is it rear wheel drive or is it all wheel drive. Where all wheel drive in this case is the dummy variable which I call di that is either 0 or 1 and it only indicates whether a particular car has all wheel drive or not. Okay? Now let me illustrate how this is actually implemented in a model. Okay. So suppose that we have the price as a function of the miles of the car and whether the car has all-wheel drive or not. Okay. So note that all-wheel drive can be either 0 or 1. So all-wheel drive is 0 or 1. So suppose that we have a car that has no all-wheel drive and that means that all-wheel all drive is equal to 0. This means that the equation can be rewritten as beta 0 plus beta 1 times miles and since all wheel drive is 0, B2, beta 2 times 0 is always 0, so the equation is only price equals beta 0 plus beta 1 times miles. If the car does have all wheel drive, then AWD is equal to 1, and hence we have price is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 times miles plus beta 2 and all wheel drive is 1 so it is only beta 2 or if you want to be correct it would be beta 2 times 1 which is only beta 2. So here you can see that we can rewrite this equation where we can say beta 0 plus beta 2 if you can think about this as the new intercept, plus beta 1 times miles. 
So we still have the same slope coefficient, but we now have this new intercept. Okay. Now we can still represent this graphically. So assume that we have the data about the that we have the data about the car. And we have price and we have Myers. Now suppose that we have two types of cars. We have with all wheel drive, which I mark blue here. And we have the data. And we have cars without all wheel drive, which I mark red. And so then we would have, so with all-wheel drive and no all-wheel drive. So in this case, we would have a regression equation for the cars without all-wheel drive. And we have a regression equation for the cars with all-wheel drive. Okay. And note that they both have the same slope, okay, because beta 1 hasn't changed, so the slope is the same. So the effect of each additional mile on the, on the price of the car is the same. But we now have beta 0 and beta 1 which would represent the value of the all-wheel drive, is now this section here, where the entire line is beta 0 plus beta 1, which is what you have here, beta 0 plus beta 2, sorry. This is this is beta two, and also this is beta two. Okay. The data set BMW contains data about used BMWs of a particular model in the Indianapolis area. You have miles of the car, you have the price of the car, and you also have a dummy variable which is coded 01 and indicates whether the car has all-wheel drive. Note that all those cars are identical in terms of the model and also the year, and the only difference between those cars is the, is the miles and whether they have all-wheel drives or not all-wheel drive or not. So in order to estimate a model, we write again fit LM and the data set is uh, BMW and the equation of interest is the price as a function of miles and all-wheel drive. So when you run this model, then here you find that both variables are statistically significant, miles and all wheel drive, and also that the depreciation of the car is 27 cents per mile. Note that this is significantly higher than uh, what we have estimated for the Honda example which was only about 6.5 miles. And you note that the variable, the coefficient associated with all-wheel drive 
is statistically significant and the coefficient itself is $3,429. What this means is that if you have two identical cars, that there's no difference in terms of mileage, then, and the only difference is that one of the cars has all-wheel drive, then the value of the all-wheel drive car is to be is expected to be $3,429 higher than a car without all-wheel drive. Now, we have seen previously that we used uh, Euler's number and also we used the natural log. And in what comes next, we are going to look at why this is important. Now, in this case, we have something what is called a log linear model. Okay. Now assume that you have a model that is written as yi, which is the dependent variable equals to beta zero times xi to the power of beta one times the error term. Okay. Now you can take the natural log on both sides of this model and you now see that we have the natural log of the dependent variable equals an intercept plus beta 1 times the natural log of the independent variable times the error term. Now let me explain of how this change in variables, taking the natural log of the variable, how it actually changes the interpretation of the model and why it is useful. So consider the question where you want to know the, the quantities, the quantity of apples consumed <clears throat> as a function of the price of apples. And let us call the quantity of apples consumed Q, and let us call the price of apples P. Okay. Now what you could do if you have data about the quantities of apples and the price of apples, you could estimate a simple linear regression model where you say the quantity of apples is a function of an intercept plus beta 1 times the price of apples, okay, plus an error term. So this is what we have. This is what we have. Uh, this is what we have uh, seen so far. And if you estimate this model, what beta one is going to tell you is that for an increase in the price of apples, say by by one dollar, how this is going to affect the quantity, the physical units of apples. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, if we take the natural logarithm of this model on both sides. So we say instead of measuring Q in physical units of apples, we take the natural log and we say the natural log of apples is a function of beta zero plus beta one times the natural log of the price of apples if we estimate this model, then the interpretation of beta 1 is going to be in terms of elasticity. Now, what does this mean? Suppose that beta 1 is equal to 0.8 or the coefficient of beta 1 that you estimate is equal to 0.8, then this 0.8 is going to be interpreted as an elasticity, meaning that if 
the price of apples increases by 1%, not in dollars, but in percent, then the quantity of apples decreases actually sorry this would be negative this would be negative point this would be negative point eight okay then the quantity of apple decreases by negative point eight times one percent is equal to point eight percent okay so now taking the natural log of both the dependent variable and the independent variable allows you to interpret the coefficient as a percentage change or as an elasticity which tells you something about the percentage change of the independent variable and what the percentage change in terms of the dep if the dependent variable is okay so here in this table I have summarized the various possibilities and note that so far we have only looked at the dependent variable and the independent variable being in what is called a level form which means that we can interpret the beta coefficient as if the independent variable changes by x how does the independent how does the dependent variable change okay so for example if the coefficient of beta is negative uh, 0.27 and we are looking at a model that estimates the mileage of a car and how it relates to the price of the car then we would say that if the miles go up by one mile or if the mileage of the car goes up by one mile then the price of the dog car decreases by, by 0.27 times one dollar uh, one mile here in the Last row, we look at the case where both the dependent variable and the independent variable are in natural log form, and then we interpret the beta coefficient as a percentage. Okay. Note that a very common model also involves leaving the dependent variable in natural log form and the independent variable leaving in level terms. To demonstrate on how to use and how to interpret natural logarithms in a multivariate regression model or in any regression model, we are going to use the data set housing. Now, housing contains information about the price of the home, the number of bedrooms, lot size, square footage, and also whether the house has a colonial style to it. So, the equation that we are interested in is taking the the natural logarithm of price and also having the natural logarithm of the lot size as well as of the square footage. So what we have to do in the first step is transform those variables into natural log. So we write housing dot, let's call it L, N price, which is for the natural log, is equal to log housing price. Note that the log in MATLAB already takes the natural log of, the, of, a, of a particular variable. And we have to do this for the price of the home as well as for the square footage and the uh, lot size. So let's say lot size and lot size here and then the square footage. So then when we evaluate the selection here, we now have three additional columns with the natural log of the price, the natural log of the lot size, and the natural log of the square footage. So note that it doesn't make sense to take the natural log of colonia since this is a zero or one variable. So the equation that we are going to estimate 
So when we evaluate the regression model, then we observe the following. First of all, note that bedrooms and colonial is not statistically significant, but that the square footage as well as the lot size are statistically significant. The square footage and the lot size, they're both, they're both positive in the sense that if lot size or square footage increases, so does the home value. Now again, note that the square footage and the lot size or the coefficient associated with those two variables can be interpreted as an elasticity. So let us take the square footage. The 0.7 can be interpreted as follows. If the square footage of the home increases by 1%, then the value of the home increases by 0.7 times 1% or by 0.7%. The same is true for the lot size. If the lot size increases by 1%, then the value of the home increases by 0.16 or 0.17 times 1%, meaning by 0.17%. Note that bedrooms and colonial are not statistically significant. Now let us use let us estimate an alternative model where we do not take the natural log of the price, but where we estimate the model in level terms. And then let's compare how to interpret the coefficients based on this second model. So now in this case, you see that again, lot size and square footage are statistically significant. And now you can see that, for example, you have the coefficient associated with square footage to be 0.124. Now remember that the home values are measured in thousand dollars. So what this means is that for each additional square foot, the home value increases by $124. So an additional square foot is valued at $124. So what this means is the following. If the coefficient is 0.7, that means if the, if the square footage goes up by 1%, then the home value increases by 0.7 times 1%, meaning by 0.7%. So assume that you estimate the model, the simple model, and we are talking about home prices, where you have price, and you simply say it is beta zero plus beta one times bedrooms. Let's just call it beds. Okay, so you don't do not take the natural log of the variables. Okay. And suppose that beta one is equal to ten thousand. So what this means is that for each additional bedroom in the house, the home value increases by ten thousand dollars. Now, let's assume that you take the natural log of price. And again, it doesn't make sense to take the natural log of beds. So you simply estimate the model beta 0 plus beta 1 times beds. And assume that beta 2 is now 0.1. Uh, sorry, beta 1. Assume that beta 1 is now 0.1. Now, what this means is that if for an additional bedroom, now 
Now this is interpreted as a percentage. The home value increases by 10%. Okay, so the home is valued 10% more with this additional bedroom. Now, why would this make more sense to estimate the natural log, to use the natural log instead of the price? Now, consider your data set where you have home values about, where you have home values and you have the bedrooms associated with those homes. And suppose you have home values that range from, say, $60,000 all the way to, say, um, $500,000. Okay. Now take those two homes, okay, where you have this low value home and high value home. Now, if you estimate this above model, then what this model tells you is if you add an additional bedroom to home number one, the $60,000 home, then the home value goes up to $70,000. And if you do the same for the $500,000 home, then the home value goes up to $510,000 okay, for an additional bedroom. Now, does it really make sense that the additional bedroom has the same value for the low value home than for the high value home? I can argue that this is probably not the case, but that instead, if you are estimating the model below, what the additional bedroom would do is it would add for the low value home, it would add 10% to the value. So this house would go to $66,000 and that it would go to $550,000 for the high valued home. Okay, so here you have a difference in that this bedroom has a different impact for the low value home than the high value home in terms of dollar value, but the impact for percentage wise percentage wise is the same. Hence it would probably make more sense in this case to add the log of the price as the dependent variable. Suppose that you want to measure the effect of income on food expenditure. Or so you have the independent variable income and you have data on the food expenditure of households. Okay. Now with a linear model, what you would do is you would run a regression equation and you would find a regression line that would look something like this. Okay. In the sense that the higher the income, the higher the expenditure on food of a household, which makes sense. Now the question is, if income increases, does it mean that for each dollar of income increase, the food expenditure is going to increase as well? Or are we going to, or is it more likely to have data that would look like this? We have an increase of food expenditure with income, but let's face it, at some point it's going to level off in the sense that you can only eat so much good food. Okay, so in reality we would not want to estimate a straight line, but we would want to estimate a line that goes, that levels off at some point. Okay? Now the first line here is what we would estimate if we had simply beta 0 plus beta 1 times x. Okay. Now, if we want to include a curvature to estimate a non-linear relationship, we can actually rewrite the equation slightly by including what is called a quadratic term. So we would write y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 times x. And then we would add a quadratic term, I would say beta 2 times x squared. So in the case here, y would be equal to the food expenditure and x would be equal to income. Okay. Now in this case, if you included a quadratic term, what you would expect to see is that beta 1 is going to be 
positive. If beta 1 is going to be positive, we see this increase. But at some point, beta 2 is going to have a dampening effect on the food expenditures. And we would expect beta, C, beta 2 to be negative. Okay? And also, and we will see this in practice, to be very small. Okay? Small, very small and negative. In that case, you would actually observe this curvature. Okay? Now, I have also illustrated this in the slides where we have this quadratic term, where we think about that the more education you get, the higher your wage is going to be, but at some point it is going to level off. To demonstrate how to use a quadratic term and an interaction term in a regression model, we are going to use the two data sets, wage and wage2. Now, wage contains information about the income, education, and the experience of various individuals. Wage 2 is similar, that it contains the wage, the education, experience, and tenure of the person, as well as the age. But note that it also includes the mother's education and the father's education. So how many years of education do the parents have? So let us first illustrate the concept of a quadratic term by using the dataset wage. We are interested in whether the wage, whether experience has a decreasing effect on wage. To do so, we first have to create a new variable, which we call experience2 or experience squared, and this is the wage dot experience squared. This creates the this creates the new variable in the data set wage. So we have experience squared is four. Uh, it's two an experience of two squared is four, twenty two squared is four eighty four and so on. Now we include this in our regression model, where we say fit LM, wage, comma, and income, tilde, education, plus experience, plus experience squared. Then we evaluate this selection. And what we see is that, first of all, all the coefficients are statistically significant. So they're all less than 1%. So they're all statistically significant at the 1% level. And they also have the expected signs that we would uh, really hypothesize. So education and experience are positive in the sense that the higher your education and the more experience you have, the higher your wage. However, note that the experience squared is also statistically significant and is negative. What this means is that over time, experience becomes, more and becomes less and less important. So your value or your income is still going to increase over time with experience, but at a decreasing rate. Mm -hmm. So this is why you would include an experience squared term to find nonlinearities in your model. Now the interaction is slightly different. So here we are going to estimate a model where we think that the parental education interacts with the with the education. So we have to use the data set wage2. And first, we are creating two new variables. So the first variable, let's call it uh, par educ, or for parental education. And that is simply the com combined education from both the mother and the father. So it's wage2 dot the mother's education 
plus the father's education. So you can you can execute this and you now have a new variable which is the parental education. Okay. Now let us create the interaction term, which we call wage2, and let's just call it uh, parental education and education, tilde education. And we define this as the uh, parental education, which we have created here, times the education of the person. This would be ED. So when we evaluate this, we now have this interaction term. Now we can run our model. where we use wage2 and the dependent variable is going to be the natural log of wage which we have to create first So we have now the, the log of the wage, and this is a function of the education, the experience, the tenure you have, and then also as well as this new variable, this interaction variable of your education and your parents' education. So when we evaluate this section, or this selection, we now have our model. And first of all, what you can see is that all variables are statistically significant, and also that the parental education is statistically significant as well which is the last line here. So what this means is that it is not only, so if you want to evaluate the marginal effect of an additional year of education, then you have this term that is constant and independent of your parents' education, but you have to add as well the term, this indirect effect, if you will, that depends on your parental education, of your parents' education. So imagine that you're looking at salary data of graduates, their income. And suppose that it is, and suppose that you assume that this is a function of schooling or the years of schooling they had. And also assume that the income depends not only on the years of schooling they had, but it also depends on a measure of the parental education. Okay. So here you can think about the story that if you have two children and they both are identical in terms of how many schooling years they had, that perhaps the person who had who has the parents that are that have more education perhaps has benefited more from the uh, has benefited more and hence has a higher income because the parental education actually or the education of the parents actually made them pay more attention to what is going on in school etc which then has an effect on income 
Note that I can also relate this model to the current situation of school closures, closures during the COVID-19 pandemic, that there is already concern that children that are schooled at home, since all the schools are closed, that children that are in households where the parents, where this, where the parents are well educated, that they are going to have fewer troubles later on than in households where parents are less educated. Okay, and we will probably see a lot of research analyzing those effects in the years to come. Okay. Now, what this model says is that an additional year of schooling for a particular student has, say, a hundred dollar increase results in say a hundred dollar uh, say a thousand dollar increase in monthly salary okay and that parental education may have an increase of say I don't know fifty dollars okay now what this means is that if you have two identical students that independent of the parental education that an additional year of schooling has the same thousand dollar effect on the income of the student. Okay. Now what the interaction term is going to do is to say that an additional year of schooling for both students, despite the fact that their parents' education is different, does not have the same effect in terms of income, but that the additional year of schooling actually depends on the parental education, the level of parental education. So if we estimated a model with an interaction term, we would say beta 0 is plus beta 1 times schooling plus beta 2 times parental education And now we would include the interaction term by saying beta 3 is schooling times parental education. Now, if you rewrite this equation, you would have beta 0 plus beta 1, beta 2 times the parental education and now we are going to rewrite this slightly by saying this is beta 1 plus beta 3 times parental education times schooling. Okay. Now, you can interpret this as the new slope associated with schooling. Now, in the previous model, this slope was constant. In the previous model, this slope of an additional year of schooling was simply beta 1. Now, in the new model, with the interaction term, the slope associated with schooling is not constant anymore. But the slope depends on the parental education. What this means is that if beta 3 is positive, which most likely it would be in, uh, in, uh, in, in reality, is that if the parental education is higher, so if you have two students and one student has parents with a higher education, then that student is going to benefit more from one year of schooling than the student whose parents are not as well educated. Okay, so the interaction term is to change the slope associated with a coefficient. Okay, meaning that the slope varies or the effect of one variable varies depending on the level of the other variable. Okay? 
That's what education, uh, that is what an interaction term is. So this concludes the lecture about multivariate regression.